Good morning, Fellowship Nashville. How are we doing? Are we awake? Oh, we got some claps. All right, I like that. Joe would stand with us as we sing this morning. When the thread of darkness has come breaking And the force of fear blows like a violent wind When confusion strikes and clouds of chaos hit I know That my heart cannot be held by circumstance for my eyes are locked on the God who sees the end. So when the world around me cries out, who can stand? I fall. All right. Oh, and I will not be moved from my feet than you. Oh, and I will not be moved from my feet than you. A firm foundation, my solid rock You can't be shaken, you won't be stopped You hold me fast, you never leave You are the hope to which I cling A firm foundation, my God you are When the mountains bow the rising way No the seas of doubt will never make me sway Yes I will rejoice within the currents of rage singing oh and I will not be moved from my feet of letting you and I will not be moved my feet, I'm letting you oh, 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 and I will not be moved from my feet, I'm letting you and I will not be moved from my feet, I'm letting you I'll feel around A firm foundation, my God, you are. Hey. You're holding me, you're holding me steady. And if it flies, I'm gonna be ready. I'm sealed in you. You're holding me, you're holding me steady. In the break of every landing, I. Sealed in you, you're holding me, you're holding me steady. If it flies, I'm gonna be ready. I'm sealed in you, you're holding me, you're holding me steady. In the break of every land, I'm sealed in. You hold me fast, you never leave You are the hope to which I cling A firm foundation, my God you are A firm foundation, my God you are One more time A firm foundation, my God you are Your firm foundation, and I will not be shaken. You're my firm foundation, and my God, you are. Sing it, church. You're my firm foundation, and I will not be shaken. 
you're my firm foundation and my guide you are and you're my firm foundation and I will not be shaken in your my firm foundation and my guide you are Amen. Amen. How are we doing? Y'all sound y'all sound beautiful this morning. So glad to be here. My name is Brett, your worship leader here at Fellowship Nashville. Man, I was a bit shaken this morning. Got here and forgot a guitar and just was just kind of all over the place. And so I don't know if y'all are like that sometimes coming into a Sunday morning, you're a little little frazzled. <laughs> um, but that's a good place to be because our, our dependence is on him. And so, yeah, I'm just grateful for you guys. Um, let me pray for us as we continue. Father, thank you that we get to rest in you. When there's so many things going on that they don't seem like a big deal when it comes down to it. So Father, would you speak to us now through these songs? Speak to us in the silence. We want to hear you. Make that our prayer this morning. Search the world, it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures of faith, I never know. Then you came along and put me back together. Is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you see them all, and you still call me friend. Cause God of the mountains, He's the God of the valley.
There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Believe it. Nothing is better. song here in a second so i'm also excited about that but it says um, out of philippians rejoice in the lord always again i will say rejoice let your reasonableness be known to everyone the lord is at hand do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be known be made known to god and the peace of god which surpass, surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts in your minds in Christ Jesus. So as we sing this next song, let's engage uh, together in that restful spirit, that restful attitude. Slow down this morning, take a breath. Doesn't that feel good sometimes? It really does. All right, let's start with this chorus. We're just gonna sing it through once. I'm gonna go into the song just to teach it. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. See on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me, my Jesus set me free. Look at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. What he's done. What he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. For the freedom he has won, even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. Oh, speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He has risen from the grave. What he's done.
on the throne of majesty the father's will complete he reigns in victory service our kids are dismissed if you're unfamiliar with where that is is behind these black curtains you'll go through these double doors and then take a left and go downstairs for those of y'all remaining if you would find somebody that looks unfamiliar introduce yourself get to know somebody take 30 seconds to a minute we'll see you back in a second Good morning, Fellowship Nashville. How are you guys doing? <laughs> I don't know. I, I woke up this morning and my back really hurt. I, I think I slept really wrong. I don't know. It doesn't feel good. Or maybe it's just because I'm like carrying the whole burden of doing the announcements by myself. I don't know. I don't know. We'll figure it out later. But welcome to Fellowship Nashville. Um, we are a gospel-centered church in the city, for the city, seeking a city above, and we're, I'm really glad that you guys are here. Um, so the first announcement is that if you, uh, we want to welcome you all in uh, joining this morning online or in person, and if you are new here, you can text F -N -N Nash Guess at 81010 so we can get you some info about our church. Um, and for all of our women here, um, there will be a dessert gathering at uh, Mrs. Coutrere's house on Friday evening, February 25th at 7 p.m. No need to register. Just show up. I'm really jealous. I've only had good food, uh, good food there. So, um, And for everybody, this is for everybody, um, men included, you are invited to our Fellowship Together launch on Sunday, March 6th. Um, this is a casual lunch after the service to meet others of the body and learn other ways to get connected. College students, it's free. So, I don't know, you get to meet a lot of people and you also get free food, so make sure you sign up. Uh, but even as uh, free college students, make sure you uh, register online just so we know how many uh, meals that we should uh, buy for you, all of y'all. Um, if you are prepared to give, uh, you can do so in the box in the back, or if you can go online to at fellowshipnashville.church slash give. Also a reminder that we are in the middle of raising funds for our new building, and so 
additional pledges or gifts to the church would be greatly appreciated. Um, and you, there's, there's information at the Connect Point if you need more info. Um, before we continue, I would like to pray for the offering. So. Heavenly Father, it's just so good to come before you um, as a group, as we worship you together. God, we are so thankful for your son and how he saved us, Lord. I'm just reminded in a thousand ways that the gospel transforms us and uh, provides life and hope to us, Lord. Thank you for being a God that is so gracious and kind uh, when we are so unfaithful to you, Lord. Um, God, all the things that you've given us, I pray that we would be gracious in giving those things back to you, Lord. And I pray that you would um, bless the money that, that we have so that we can serve your kingdom with a greater purpose and to do good for our world and continue to um, glorify you through the process. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, thank you, Sam. We are so grateful for our college students. And Sam, when you graduate, you're going to have to find a replacement um, to come up and give announcements, but thank you. Welcome to Fellowship Nashville. Um, just wanted to make a, a quick announcement as well to follow up on the announcements you just heard. We, we are going to be adjusting our COVID protocols very soon. Um, hospitalizations are um, plateauing and starting to trend downward just a little bit, which is great news. Um, case... COVID case numbers are plummeting in Davidson County, and so we anticipate uh, lifting our temporary request during this Omicron surge to mask up. So stay tuned for more info on that this week. I really enjoyed 1994. Some of you weren't born yet, but um, not only was it the year that I graduated from college, it was also the year that arguably the best movie of all time was released. This movie has been sitting on top of IMBD's um, independent, I don't know what that stands for, but IMDB, IMDb International, movie database. International Movie, or is it Internet Movie Database? Either or. Okay. <laughs> Find out. Let me know. IMBD's list. It's been sitting on top of that list of top 250 movies for almost 25 years now. And it's not Forrest Gump. That movie was also released in 1994 and was my, one of my favorite movies, but that's ranked 12th, okay, on that list. What is it? It's not Santa Claus. No. Do, any other guesses as to what? Armageddon? No. I haven't heard it yet. The Shawshank Redemption. The Shawshank. Oh, okay. If you've never seen it, I'm not going to spoil it for you. No, there's no spoilers in this sermon, but... You've got to see it. You really do. There is a reason why it's held the top spot on that list as the highest ranked movie of all time. You, once you see it, you'll understand. You know, I can't prove it, but I'm fairly convinced that it's doggedly held on to that top spot because the themes in the movie so closely resonate with the human heart. The main themes touch on the deepest longings that we all experience, for wrongs to be made right, for what is broken to be restored, to, for what is lost to be found, for what is empty to be made full, for what is ruined to be redeemed. And I also think that it's for this very reason that I've so enjoyed our study through the Old Testament short story of Ruth together over the past month and a half. As we've, as we've traced the story of two widows, Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, whose lives were totally devastated, but who end up having things restored, finding hope and life and fullness. Throughout the pages of, of this Old Testament short story, we've re seen Naomi and Ruth go from hurt to hope, from despair to delight, from ruin to redemption. And as we wrap up the narrative today, we're going to discover that the book of Ruth is more than just an Old Testament Testament short story. It's more than a nice, quaint little story tucked away in the pages of the Old Testament with a happy ending. Do you realize that if this story hadn't happened, you and I wouldn't be sitting here today? We're going to see that this narrative isn't just a redemptive story about Ruth. It's ultimately a story about your redemption and my redemption, and not just that, but the redemption of the entire 
world. I also don't know what you've carried into this room with you this morning. But I imagine in a room this size, many of you carried in heartache. Many of you carried in pain, difficult circumstances, brokenness. And if you've ever questioned whether God is really sovereign over your life, if you've ever questioned that he knows what he's doing with all the mess, if you've ever wondered what on earth God is up to with all the dysfunction and despair that life throws at us around every corner, I'm glad you're here because my prayer and my expectation is that you're going to be profoundly encouraged by what we're going to discover from God's word this morning as we wrap up this Old Testament short story of Ruth. Before we dive in to the second half of chapter four and finish out this book, I'd like to give you a quick review just in case you've missed a couple weeks or this is your first time here with us. Ruth is divided into four chapters, okay? Hold up four fingers for me. Four chapters. Okay, chapter one. Chapter one, we find, we meet Ruth and Naomi. Naomi and her Moabite daughter-in-law named Ruth return to Israel after running away from, after, and, and Naomi, um, Ruth didn't return to Israel, but Naomi did. Ruth had never been to Israel before. Naomi returned to Israel after running away with her husband, Eli Melech, along with their two sons, running away from God in the promised land to God-forsaken Moab, a place you would not want to go. Those were Israel's enemies. Tragedy strikes in Moab. Naomi loses her husband, Eli Melech. She also loses her two sons who had married Moabite women to death. And then um, she decides, she hears that there's, there's food back in Bethlehem, and she decides, I'm going to go back. And she dissuades one of her daughters-in-law from coming with her, but she can't dissuade Ruth. Ruth is a very loyal and loving daughter-in-law. says, no, I'm going to stick with you. Your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. You're not getting rid of me this quick, Naomi. I'm going to make sure that you're provided for and cared for. And so Ruth returns with Naomi to Bethlehem. But utterly destitute. And Naomi is bitter at God. She's mad. She's mad at what has happened with losing her husband, losing her son. She feels that God has turned his back on her. And here at the end of chapter one are two widowed, destitute women without provision or protection. They're in dire need of two things. There's two main needs, food and family. And chapter one is dark, but then chapter two comes. Hold up two fingers. Okay, we're in chapter two. Chapter 2 comes, and there's glimmers of hope. There's glimmers of light. Ruth goes out into the fields, and she, she meets a man named Boaz. She just so happens to show up in his field, and Boaz just so happens to show, notice her, and Boaz just so happens to show kindness to her and tells his workers to leave extra grain for Ruth to collect and take back to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And as readers, we begin to think, hmm, maybe there's something else going on here. Maybe this other prop food is being taken care of, but what about this other problem of family? Maybe that's going to be taken care of too because Boaz is identified as a kinsman redeemer. Someone who could buy Eli Melech's fields, marry Ruth, and provide an heir for Naomi and Ruth to carry on their family name and inheritance. Hmm, is it going to happen? But then chapter two ends with a downer. Wah, wah, wah. Ruth still lived with her mother-in-law. Boaz never makes a move. Two to three months of barley harvest, not even a pickup line. So in chapter three, Naomi takes matters into her own hands. Where are we? Chapter three, okay? We're in three. Naomi takes matters into her own hands, devises a manipulative scheme to entrap Boaz into providing for them, a scheme that puts her daughter-in-law, Ruth, in a very precarious situation at great risk of shame and disgrace. But thanks to the courage of Ruth and the accompanying noble character of Boaz, Naomi's less than noble plan is jettisoned, and Ruth and Boaz end up agreeing to get married. But then we get to the end of chapter 3, and there's a catch. 
There's a, we learn that there's another man in the picture. Some other guy, a closer relative, has the right before Boaz to serve as the kinsman redeemer. He has the right before Boaz to marry Ruth and redeem Elimelech's fields. So in chapter 4, Boaz meets this other guy at the city gate where business like this was conducted and masterfully sets this guy up. He states, well, he starts out just by mentioning the land part of the deal. And this guy's all about it. This other potential kinsman redeemer is like, yeah, I'll buy that land because land was everything in that day. And then Boaz puts the hook in. <laughs> And we read in chapter 4, verse 5, Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. And all of a sudden, this nameless guy who is so excited about buying the fields backs out of the deal. Nope, no thank you, not going to do that, not going to marry a Moabite woman, not going to make that sacrifice, not going to establish an inheritance that won't be in my own family's name. I'm out. But Boaz doesn't have the same prejudice against marrying a Moabite woman. Why not? Why not? And this is where I find it absolutely absolutely fascinating how God works. Do you know who Boaz's mother was? Anyone know? Let me say her name. So those those of you who are familiar with her Old Testaments will recognize it probably. Rahab. Rahab was Boaz's mother. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho, a Canaanite prostitute in Jericho that sheltered the Israelite spies when they came in to spy on the promised land before conquering it under under Joshua. The story goes that Israel did come, rescued Rahab because of her kindness to the spies, did not um, um, basically provided for her, protected her. She ends up marrying an Israelite man, becoming included in the covenant family of God. And she and this Israelite man had a son named Boaz. Boaz. Boaz's own mother had been an outsider, a foreigner, who who had been included into the covenant family of God. So Boaz did not have the same qualms about marrying a Moabite woman, a foreigner. Boaz is God's man uniquely prepared for this role of include, including a widowed Moabite into the covenant family of God as well. And this brings us up to speed on where we left off last week and where we'll pick up the narrative again right in the middle of chapter 4 beginning with verse 13. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up to, to chapter 4 verse 13. Also, the words will be up on the screen behind me as we go along. Let's read together. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And in the same literary style that we saw in chapter 1, where tragedy after tragedy hits like dominoes falling, cold and hard, boom, 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 one right at the other. But almost the, the same literary device is used here, except in the opposite direction. The dominoes are coming back up. This is good news. Everything sad is becoming untrue, being turned upside down. In one verse, in two short, compressed sentences, the narrator captures for us the total redemption of Ruth's story. Everything sad is being flipped on its head. The narrator has used long chunks of narration to to talk about a lot of the other parts of the story. You know, gleaning in the fields, whole chapter. The threshing room floor, whole chapter. And then, in one verse, we have a wedding and a baby. Just like that. (laughs) I find it kind of humorous. The resolution to the problem of the whole book, food and family, it's all solved in one Verse, but, but did you catch what the narrator emphasized here in this verse? It's easy to skip it, easy to miss it, but it's very intentional. If you have your Bible open, I want you to underline this phrase. I'm going to put the, word, the, the verse back up on the screen with that phrase underlined so you can take note of it. What's that phrase? And the Lord gave her conception. Now, we've seen the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Lord. That's, whenever you see that in your Old Testament, that's the covenant name of God, Yahweh. We've seen Yahweh at work behind 
kind of behind the scenes of every verse in the book of Ruth, but there's only two times that, that the narrator says, hey, this is, a, he brings the Lord to the forefront and, and mentions action that the Lord actually did. He puts a spotlight on, on the Lord's, Yahweh's involvement. And, and one is right here in this verse, but the other place is back in chapter one, verse six. Let's go back and look at that place where the Lord is explicitly put in the foreground as the one doing the action. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, that's Naomi. Um, She, Naomi, arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So here in chapter 1 and again in chapter 4, the Lord is put at the forefront. And the narrator points out that Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, has done something here in chapter 1. What has he done? He's provided food for his covenant people. Food is what? It's one of the two main needs, remember, that we have in, in this narrative. What's the other main need? What is it? Family. And in chapter 4, we read what? And the Lord gave her conception. The narrator is very intentional to make, us, make sure that we as the readers know that without a doubt, it's Yahweh who's the one who's meeting the needs. It's Yahweh who's the one who's providing food, providing family. Yahweh hasn't forsaken Naomi and Ruth. He hasn't turned his back on his covenant people. And here's the conclusion. It's Yahweh alone that is able to meet the deepest needs that we have in our lives. This barren, destitute, Moabite widow of a deceased, faithless Israelite, unable to conceive, unable to have children for over 10 years, is now fully redeemed. Put yourself in Ruth's sandals right now. How would she have felt? A short while ago, she was destitute, vulnerable, hopeless, an unwelcome foreigner in the land of Israel. But now she's the wife of Boaz, a worthy, honorable Israelite man, a man of chesed, loyal love, a faithful Israelite. She's included as part of the covenant family of God. And can you imagine her tears of joy as she realized she's finally pregnant? After all these years, that her dreams of being a mother would finally be realized and she would hold a baby of her very own. And then this baby is born. And this baby can serve as an heir. Everything that Ruth had wished for has come true in real life. She's married to an honorable man who loves her. And together they bear a son who by leveret marriage can serve as the heir, can carry on the family name can inherit the fields of Eli Melech. The clan is preserved. Disaster is averted. All is well in the end. But hear this. This isn't just Ruth's story. Ruth's redemption is just the beginning of what the narrator wants us to see. In verse 14, the camera zooms out a little bit. And we see that this is not just Ruth's story. It's also Naomi's story of redemption as well. The scene shifts to a birthday party of sorts um, for this baby boy that's been born to Ruth. And, And the women of the community, the women of Bethlehem, have gathered around for this birthday party. They're gathering around Naomi as she holds her grandchild on on her lap. Verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. That's the the, the Hebrew word for redeemer is goel. You want to say that with me? Goel. Okay, that's the Hebrew word for redeemer. And immediately our, our, our minds go to, we've heard this before. We've heard redeemer used before. We've heard goel used before in this book. And who are we thinking of? Boaz, right? He's called the Redeemer, but, but something has shifted here. Look who's called a Goel now. It's not Boaz. There's been a shift. Blessed be the Lord who's not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him, the Goel, the Redeemer. So who's the Redeemer now? It's not Boaz, but it's Boaz's boy. The child, the son is now the heir who will redeem Naomi's life and family line by inheriting the fields and carrying on the family name of Elimelech. 
her deceased husband. And the ladies of Bethlehem are pronouncing a blessing on Naomi and her grandbaby here, saying, may this child's name be renowned in Israel. We don't know the name yet, but the neighborhood ladies are about to take care of that. Hold that thought. And all this happened because of who? Ruth. Ruth, the Moabite. Naomi's loving and loyal daughter-in-law who these ladies, these neighborhood ladies of Bethlehem now extol, asserting to Naomi that having Ruth is better than having seven sons. Naomi had lost her only two sons and the neighborhood ladies are saying, Naomi, Ruth is better than, than having seven boys. When Naomi mistakenly thought that she was totally empty on her return to Israel from Moab, in actuality, the very fullness of God was standing right next to her in the person of a Moabite daughter-in-law named Ruth, and she just had no clue. And Naomi now has a grandson, a redeemer, one who will be the restorer of life for her, a redeemer of what was lost. Verse 16, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born To Naomi, they named him, say it with me, Obed, Obed. Put yourself in Naomi's sandals now. Imagine her joy as she looks down at her grandchild laying in her lap, bouncing him on her knee, perhaps. She's just heard the blessing of the neighborhood ladies, and tears of happiness probably formed in her eyes and begin rolling down her wrinkled and weathered cheeks. In chapter 1, she had told these same neighborhood ladies of Bethlehem not to call her Naomi when she arrived. Naomi is a shortened form of the kindness of Yahweh. It's just kindness, but it's a shortened form of the kindness of Yahweh. That's what her name means. And she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. The Lord has been anything but kind to me. He's just shown me bitterness. Don't call me that anymore. My name is Mara. My name is bitter. Because God has been bitter to me and my hands are completely empty. I have nothing. But here in chapter 4, her hands are no longer empty. Yahweh has indeed shown his kindness to her. In spite of her bitterness, her hands are now full with a grandson. The neighborhood ladies say, a son has been born to Naomi. Not Mara. They don't call her Mara. A son has been born to who? The kindness of Yahweh, to Naomi. They call her by her real name. She's back. It's interesting here that this is Ruth's son, isn't it? And yet the neighborhood ladies say that a son has been born to who? Naomi. Well, why? Because this isn't just Ruth's story of redemption, it's Naomi's story of redemption as well. And then the neighborhood ladies proceed, this is kind of humorous, they proceed to name the baby. I don't know how many of you would let your neighbors name your child, but that's what happens here. And and what do these ladies name the the Andrew and Florence? Um, Florence's due date was yesterday, and she's here. Um, So would you let us name your your daughter? No thanks? Okay. Um, Andrew's for it, but Florence isn't. Um, Anyway, what what did they name this baby? Obed. Obed. Do you know what Obed means in Hebrew? Obed means servant. Servant. And this is a fitting name. Well, why? Well, he's going to be the restorer of life, the rescuer, the redeemer of the family's line and inheritance. And his life serves so many ends for so many people. In a sense, he's the servant of all. Obed, servant, in this story. And in this story, we're a movie. Right here is where the credits start rolling up the screen. And you'd reach for your jackets and and, and your water bottles that you brought in, and you'd stand up and you'd start heading towards the exits. The plot line has been resolved. The tension is gone. Naomi and Ruth have food and family. Both made needs have been taken care of. All is well in the end. And as movie watchers, we're heading towards the exits to go get into our cars. And then we hear something on the screen. Wait, it's not over yet? And like a Marvel movie, we come running back to our seats to see, see this, this final scene. The narrator's not done. Something stops us in our tracks. 
And we hear the narrator continue. This isn't just Ruth's story of redemption, and it's not just Naomi's story either. And our narrator's camera zooms out just a little bit more to show us a broader scene. Look at the second half of Ruth chapter 4, verse 17. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David? Really? Wait, what? <laughs> David? You mean David as in King David? The guy who wrote most of the Psalms in the Bible? The shepherd king of Israel? The king who is called a man after God's own heart? The king whose symbolic star still flies on Israel's flag today? David? That David? Wow. This is the story of God working in one of the darkest times of Israel's history. Remember, this is a period of the judges, a time period when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. There was chaos. There was, there was dysfunction in society. Why? Because they had no king. And this is a story of how God paved the way for the arrival of one of the greatest kings in Israel's history, King David. This is a story of how God preserved the line of the king. And we learn this just at the very end of the book. Wow, just wow. And Ruth is David's great-grandmother. Did you see that coming? Well, maybe you did because you know, knew the story ahead of time. But if you, this is the first time you were reading the story, you'd be going, oh my goodness, wow. This is a lot bigger than I thought it was. This isn't just about Ruth. This isn't just about Naomi. This is King David's story as well. And do you realize... That when the prophet Samuel was sent by God to Jesse in Bethlehem to anoint one of Jesse's sons as king, as king of Israel, Samuel passed over all of the sons that were presented to him. And he asked, is there anyone else? Do you have any other sons? And Jesse goes, well, yeah, there's one out in the fields tending the sheep. Which fields? Which fields? These are the very fields that Boaz redeemed. These are the very fields that Boaz bought. These are Elimelech's, Eli Melech's fields. Those are the very fields that the shepherd King David grew up in. And about a thousand years later, those are likely the very fields where shepherds were tending their flocks by night. When a host of angels appeared and gave the greatest announcement of redemption that the world has ever heard. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's stick to Ruth. That's where we're going, but let's get back to Ruth. God used a widowed Moabite woman who comes into the picture because of the disobedience of a faithless Israelite man who turned his back on God and ran away from the promised land to Moab. God used this to bring redemption and hope to an otherwise hopeless situation to bring a great king for Israel onto this scene. And to get to this point across, the narrator then finishes the book with a genealogy. A 10-generation genealogy. Verse 18, let's read it together. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered, fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. 10 generations. Why? Why 10 generations? What's significant about that? Well, this is dripping with symbolism. Back in chapter 1, there were 10 years of death and barrenness for Ruth the Moabite. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, contains a prohibition that says, No Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. But that prohibition is being ended here by the gracious and sovereign hand of God. And this short story that began with the phrase, In the days when the judges ruled ends with an introduction to the most famous king in Israel's history. And we realize, friends, that this is way bigger than just a love story between Boaz and Ruth. God is at work behind the scenes here. This is a sovereign God who's bringing about a much bigger redemption than we had pictured. 
a much bigger redemption than Boaz and Ruth could have ever imagined. This is a sovereign God at work weaving together famine and disobedience and displacement and death and destitution and sorrow and pain and emptiness and barrenness and a foreigner and a scheming mother-in-law and a nameless kinsman redeemer who shirked his responsibility when he found that it involved marrying a Moabite. This is God weaving all of this together to bring about a redemption that's even bigger than the narrator of this Old Testament short story could have ever imagined. What does the word redeem mean? It means to buy, to purchase or set free by the payment of a price. And the entire story of the Bible, my friends, the whole meta narrative is ultimately about God setting a people free from sin by doing what? By paying a price. And so even though King David is as far out as this narrator's camera can zoom, zoom, I'd like to pick up the camera and zoom it out a little further for us by looking at the first verses of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, which is where, what was our springboard in getting into this series in the first place. Remember, we studied through the first two chapters of Matthew during Advent, and we skipped the genealogy because I wanted to save it for now. I wanted to save it for now. The very first verses of the New Testament, Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of who? David, the son of Abraham. So then Matthew begins his genealogy with Abraham in verse 2. And then in verse 5 we read, And Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And then he picks up where Ruth left off and continues the line. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And then skipping ahead 20 generations down to verse 15. And Eliad, the father of Eleazar. And Eleazar, the father of Matan. And Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Christ means anointed one in Greek. It's the same word as Messiah in Hebrew. It means the anointed king. My friends, this isn't just a story about Ruth. This isn't just a story about Naomi. This isn't just a story about David. Why did God choose to preserve this Old Testament short story for thousands of years to be told among God's people even to this day? It's not just for our entertainment. It's for a much deeper reason. My friends, the book of Ruth contains the backstory of the Christ, of the Messiah, of Jesus, which is in Hebrew, Yeshua, Joshua, the Lord saves. As great a king as David was, he wasn't perfect. Far from it, far from it. The people of God were waiting for and anticipating a greater, greater shepherd king in the family line of David. Another king, another anointed one, a Messiah that God had promised would come from the house and lineage of David. To rule and to reign on the throne, not just for a generation, but for eternity. That was the promise. They were looking for that. A son who would be given, a royal son of David born where? In Bethlehem, the heir to the throne, the one who would be the restorer of life, the rescuer, the one who would save his people from their sins, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the good shepherd, and the servant of all. In a sense, the true and better Obed. The king who would tell his disciples, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. The redeemer, the true and greater redeemer, Goel, the king who would ultimately bear the price of Ruth's redemption, Naomi's redemption, Boaz's redemption, David's redemption, your redemption, my redemption. The king who purchased us, bought us, redeemed us by his blood shed on a cross. The king who conquered death through resurrection and by grace through faith set us free by paying a price. That we might have life and a future and a name and an inheritance. That we might be included in the covenant family of God as sons and daughters, heirs forever. 
in Christ. And Jesus is the king who will one day return to make all things new and to rule with peace and equity and justice, ushering, ushering in shalom, human flourishing forever. As we read in Revelation chapter 21, the end of the story, the larger story. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be the Though will be with them as their God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne, who's, who is that? Jesus. He who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Everything sad is going to become untrue. Everything will be redeemed. Not just lives, but the entire cosmos, the entire creation. My friends, this is not just Ruth's story. It's not just Naomi's story. It's not just David's story. This is the story of the redemption of the entire world through Jesus. Do you see the significance of this? The healing of the entire universe and the plot line of all of redemptive history hinges on this Old Testament short story. Do you see how God sovereignly weaves things together to bring beauty from ashes, hope from despair, purpose from pain, salvation from sinfulness, redemption from ruin? God is weaving together an intricate tapestry of redemption. Boaz and Ruth had no clue what God was doing behind the scenes of their circumstances. He had, they, they had no idea what he was doing through their story. They had no idea what it would mean someday for you and for me and, and indeed the entire world. You know, as they looked up the stars together from that threshing floor, just trying to get their heads around what was going to happen the next day, they had no idea what was going on. Even Naomi had no concept about how her loss and sorrow and grief and bitterness could be turned in, into such joy and hope and a future, not only for her, but for the entire world. She had no clue. And, and yet without their awareness, in, indeed not even asking for their permission, God was at work behind the scenes, weaving together all these things for his glory and their ultimate good, and ultimately the good of the entire world. And if he, let me just ask you a question. If God worked this way for Ruth and Boaz and Naomi, is he the same God today? In our lives? Yes. Which well, stands to reason that, that he works the same way in your life and in my life, even when we're not aware of it, even without asking our permission. He's at work amidst all of the messiness and brokenness and pain and disappointment and sorrow and displacement and dysfunction and grief and loss that you carried into this room with you this morning. He's at work. But here's the problem. In our finiteness, in our limited knowledge, in our short-sightedness, we really have no clue what God is up to behind the scenes. We can only see the backside of this intricate, redemptive tapestry that he is weaving. You know, I borrowed a cross-stitch um, from Eleanor Douglas. Is Eleanor here? Okay. There you are, Eleanor. Thanks for letting me borrow this. And if, if you look at the underside, <laughs> you would think, what on earth is going on here? You know, to use um, 
Eleanor's own words, it's a hot mess. It's a hot mess. And you think, look at all those ugly knots and threads. Eleanor Douglas is out of control and has no idea what she's doing. But it's only when you flip it to see the front side that you see the creator's intentions. And then you start understanding the beauty. That Eleanor Douglas actually does know what she's doing. It's only when you see the finished product that the bigger picture comes together. And what you and I were to te tempted to think was total chaos turns out to be something quite sweet in the end. I don't know what tangled mess of knots and threads you carried into this room with you today, my friend. But know this. God is in the weaving business. He's in the business of taking all of the broken mess and working it together for our ultimate good and his ultimate glory. In Romans 8, 28, we read, say this out loud with me, would you? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. This does not mean that everything that happens to us is good. Hear me on that. I'm not candy coating this life. No, this does not deny the reality of pain and brokenness and death and despair and darkness. But what it does mean is that we can trust God in the midst of it to still be at work. To be working behind the scenes, weaving things together. And we can trust that he's weaving a tapestry of redemption in our lives as well. Just like he did for Naomi and Ruth. He can do for us and bring redemption from ruin. Will you trust him today? As the band co comes back up, let's read this other verse from the Old Testament together, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, out loud. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. The promise here is that isn't that our paths will be smooth. There will be bumps. There will be pain. There will be sorrow. There will be disappointment. There will be loss. There will be grief. But the promise here is that through everything, God is with us and will sovereignly and graciously make our paths straight. In other words, he'll put us right where he needs us to be for his redemptive purposes in our lives, through our lives, and the lives of people that will come after us. He is busy at work, re weaving together an intricate tapestry of redemption. And your story, my story, is part of that. He's weaving redemption from ruin. Trust him. He's got this. Let's pray. Father, our, our hearts echo the, the heart of King David when he wrote, Surely in good, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we see how you weave circumstances together, even the messiness, the pain and the brokenness and the grief and the death and the despair. You, you weave it together to bring yourself glory, and you weave it together for our good and ultimate redemption. And we trust you when it's hard. And Lord, we admit it is hard. We're so easily discouraged. Our eyes, are, 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 we're so myopic when we just feel the pain of our own circumstances and think you must be out of control. You must not love us. You must not know what you're doing, God. Our hearts are so accusatory towards you. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to trust. Help us to submit. Help us to, like the, the writer of the Proverbs said, not lean on our own understanding, knowing that our own understanding is so myopic, it's so short-sighted, it's so, in, so finite. We don't see the end, but through your word we do. And it reminds us to take a long-range view of life. It reminds us that you're still at work in the shadows. You're still at work behind the scenes. You're the master weaver of our stories, and we trust you. We trust you. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand in response and sing with me?
We have a good, good father. He loves us more than we can even imagine. And he's weaving our stories together, no matter the pain, no matter the despair, no matter the disappointment. He's there. He's there, working behind the scenes. He's got you. I'm going to throw some reflection questions up on the screen. Go ahead and take a picture of them if you want to use them later with your family, with your friends, with your city groups. Looking ahead, we're going to be launching a sermon series soon back in the New Testament through the parables of Jesus, which are earthly stories with eternal meanings. And so we'll be doing that in two weeks. But next week, we're going to be capping off our Ruth series by inviting members of our congregation to come up and share their stories, their individual stories of redemption. It's going to be an encouraging time. You won't want to miss it. We've invited four members of our body to come share their story with you. So don't miss that next week. Come in person or tune in online. But go today with the reminder that God's got you. He's with you. He's a good, good father, and you're loved. Deeply, deeply loved. Go and be a conduit of that love this week where you live, work, learn, and play. Go and be the church. You're dismissed.